Thank you so much to everyone who has joined us tonight. Um, my name is Christina Koopman. I'm the gallery manager here at River Arts on Water Gallery. And I wanna welcome you all virtually to Prairie de Sac, Wisconsin from wherever you may be joining us from. I just have a couple of housekeeping items that I'd love to glance over really quick before we get too far into the, the evening tonight. Um, while we're in the presentation, I'm gonna ask audience members to please go on mute, just because when we have this many folks joining us, if there's a phone ringing or a dog barking, you never quite know exactly what will come out of that. Um, so just for some ease of use and respect of the group size, we'll ask for the most part if you can stay on mute for the duration of the meeting. The schedule for events tonight, I'm going to give a really quick intro for our artists tonight. Then I'll ask Georgia and Helen to both tell us a little bit about themselves and their artwork and the show that they're part of. And then we'll open it up to questions from each of you. If you have one, you don't have to ask anything, but um, in the lower center right of the uh, Zoom menu is a chat feature. Um, you can click on that, the chat, and type in your question later on in the event tonight. Lindsay Giese already said hello. Good evening, everyone. Lindsay is the executive director of River Arts, Inc. She's my coworker and um, joining us for the uh, Zoom chat tonight, tuning in to say hello. So hi, Lindsay. <laughs> um, I'll go over that again when it's time to do the question and answer session as well. But for now, really, the first thing, of course, is just, hi, welcome. My name is Christina. Again, for those of you who I don't, I see lots of familiar faces, but a lot of new faces, which is really nice. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm so excited that you could join us for this evening's talk. I appreciate you all coming along on this crazy COVID Zoom adventure that we've all been learning to be a part of. You know, of course, that the word of the day is pivot. Um, we're all learning that, learning new skills and learning how to communicate and collaborate in new ways. And this just kind of is proof that I think the arts community is very well set up to do that. So, um, River Arts Inc. is a nonprofit organization located in Prairie de Sac, Wisconsin. We operate River Arts on Water Gallery. And we're proud to feature nearly 40 local artists year round in a wide variety of media. We are so excited one of those artists is Georgia Vaita, who you'll speak with here in just a moment. And we also feature guest artists periodically throughout the year that we don't get to have their work all the time, but we are big supporters and fans of what they do. It helps us rotate and see different art and new artists and give different opportunities throughout the year. So we're so excited to feature Helen Klebesaddle as our guest artist from now through at the end of the year. Yes, little applause for Helen, yes. <laughs> Helen's also been uh, gracious enough to teach in our studio space a couple of times already. We plan to have her back in the future when the world is slightly back to normal, hopefully soon. <laughs> um, so again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I am going to turn it over now to Georgia to tell us a little bit about her work and their exhibit, Force of Nature. So Georgia, take it away. All right. So um, thank you. I want to thank the River Arts and Water Gallery for offering this exhibition and, uh, and for also being one of the few art galleries left in this, in this state. I've uh, been from gallery to gallery. And, many times in different locations and seen a lot of them for, for different reasons have resorted to becoming gift shops. And uh, River Arts on Water is still a really fine art gallery with a variety of uh, prices, of course, of items that could be purchased as gifts and not just heirloom quality items. So anyway, I, I really appreciate the gallery and being a part of it. Um, so, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. You've seen my jewelry. Uh, I think it speaks for itself in some ways. And because it's so nature oriented, you might think that I grew up in the, uh, surrounded by the natural world, but actually I was born in Chicago 
and um, grew up in the city, not in the inner city. Um, I was fortunate enough to grow up um, on the north side and on a street that dead ended at the beach. So I didn't even have to cross the street to get to Lake Michigan. So that was my natural world, um, Lake Michigan. And um, it was a wonderful place to grow up compared to where, uh, what could have been, but there were not a lot of trees and flowers and um, things that occupy my interest now. But uh, starting about age 10, my parents sent me to summer camp in Wisconsin. And that's where I fell in love with the natural world, truly. And in fact, one year at the end of the summer, I stood in a field surrounded by pine trees and wildflowers. And I, I said this out loud. I almost made, I made a wish. I said, I wish I could live at a summer camp all year round. Now, you know how they say, be careful what you ask for because something bad might happen. Well, something good can also happen if you wish for it. Because 10 years later, I in fact found myself living at a summer camp. What happened was I went to school out east. I didn't like the East Coast. Uh, it was too crowded for me and came back to Wisconsin. Ended up living at a, a place called Hilltop. And at Hilltop, the, the, uh, the man who owned the property was an architect and his wife ran a summer camp for girls. So there I was, I li lived in a house on top of a hill. Um, he made a tree out of an apple, a table out of an apple tree. He put the apple tree in the house, cut it, and cut it in half, put a piece of plywood on top of it as a table. There were floor to ceiling windows uh, so I could look out and there was grass, uh, a shag rug that looked just like grass. So that's where I started connecting, really. I would look out my window. Now, I don't know where the camera is, but can you see this? Mm -hmm. I got it in the right place. This is the first, one of the first pieces of jewelry I made. It's what I saw when I looked out the window <laughs> at the top of the hill. <laughs> it's a tree and, um, and the moon. And that, so those pieces began showing up. <laughs> and I, I first learned to make jewelry by going to a class at a technical school. Um, if you're from the Madison area, you know MATC, Madison Area Technical College. I took a class there with a wonderful teacher named Kristen Anderson and learned basic jewelry skills. I, my, my education was in education. Um, I don't have an arts degree, but I did have the opportunity to move to Germany and I studied one-on-one -on -one with a German goldsmith for three years. So I think that's fine in education yeah. as, you, as you can come by, at least that's what I feel. And I had the opportunity to be brought into the European style of, of fine art, of making jewelry. He, he called himself a goldsmith. In, uh, in Europe, if you make objects out of silver, you're called a, uh, gold, a silversmith. And uh, if you make just gold, you're goldsmiths. Anyway, I worked with him for three years and then I just kept developing my skill, taking classes here and there and uh, couldn't stop. So um, I, I do tend, to, uh, my studio now is, um, a log cabin in the woods, and I'm surrounded by trees and flowers, and you can see that in my um, in my jewelry, um, and it informs everything that I make. And um, I don't know what else to say. It's my inspiration, and um, <clears throat> let me think. What else is of interest? Oh, the technique that I use is called fabrication. That's prim primarily my technique, which involves um, creating a, drawing a pattern and apply, uh, I, what I do is I glue the pattern to a piece of silver and then I saw it out with a jewelry saw and then I glue the parts together. And in fact, um, these earrings that I'm wearing, which can you see them? They're, they're dragonfly wing yeah. earrings. Do they show up? Where am I? <laughs> okay. Um, when I was at this place where I lived, 
the, uh, the woman invited me for tea. Um, Helen, you know her, that was Eloise Fritz. Oh, invited, sure. uh, invited me over for tea. And we were sitting on the terrace having a cup of tea and her grandson found a dragonfly wing. And I think it was so beautiful and he gave it to me as a gift. And I thought, boy, that would be a lovely piece of jewelry and this design cannot be improved on. So what I did was I put it in a copy machine. <laughs> I made a copy. And so these dragonfly wing earrings, which uh, are part of the show and that, I, that are my signature piece because I just love them and make them all the time. This is not a design I thought up. This is actually the design of the dragonfly wing. So sometimes I imitate nature and sometimes I'm inspired to make pieces that reflect what I see but are not exact replicas. And that's my story. <laughs> Thanks so much, Georgia. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a couple questions for you. I know everyone will as well. But before yeah. we get to that, I'm wondering if Helen, you'd be able to tell us a little bit about yourself and your artwork. Sure, sure. Um, I always start out by saying I'm a Wisconsin farm girl. And actually, I grew up in Wyoming Valley, Wisconsin, in Spring Green, Wisconsin. But in Wyoming Valley, I lived next door to the Hilltop Camp that oh. she's talking about and actually went there as a young girl, too. To the camp, and uh, Georgia and I, yeah, I want to I want to thank River Art on Water um, Gallery for including me in this exhibition as a visiting artist. I was very excited to be um, paired with Georgia, and I know that uh, she had the final word on that. So thank you, Georgia. <laughs> and, and I've known Georgia since she was my privilege <laughs> in our twenties, and I first met you as the um, that woman with the binoculars who's always trying to look at birds as she's driving <laughs> you, you pulled over I, <laughs> but you were i just i first met you as a nature lover so i thought that uh, I, should, I would mention that well i probably influenced you <laughs> perhaps <laughs> we can see it in the art we have in this show um, so I, uh, I went, to, I always wanted to be an artist. I was supported to be an artist by my parents, which is unusual. But my parents thought that uh, being an artist would be an economic step up from farming. We had a grade B dairy farm out in Wyoming Valley. And uh, the unfortunate uh, part of that is that it actually was. <laughs> and if anybody knows what artists make, you know that that's not saying much. Oh. But uh, I went away to school and went to, I couldn't, couldn't wait to go to art school and went away to school in uh, Milwaukee at a little private art school called Layton School of Art. And um, I got a scholarship to go back the next year. I was there a year and a half, but I dropped out. And I dropped out. I don't, I just felt like I didn't belong there. But later I realized it was because I was not taught by one single woman artist the entire time I was there. There were no women on the faculty and there were no women in the art history books or any of the curriculum as well. I think I heard Georgia O'Keeffe mentioned once, but it was kind of with derision. So I always felt like I was taught that women couldn't really be artists. I don't think they meant to teach me that, but I think that's what I was being taught. So I went away and started a house painting business and painted houses, barns, and churches with a company. And I only hired women, and we called ourselves Painted Ladies. So there are a lot of places out in the Spring Green. I remember Green. seeing you painting buildings. <laughs> yes, yes. I, we painted the church in Spring Green once, and I, we got down off the ladder. There were eight women painting it, and I turned around, and there was this lineup of lawn chairs with old men in it watching <laughs> us do it. So. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Um, but I eventually decided I, um, uh, for, I could I decided I needed to go back to school. And so I went back to school at 28 and I um, started over as a freshman at 28 and uh, studied art, but I also studied women, uh, now it's called women and gender studies, but at that time it was women's studies. And the combination of the art and the women and gender studies have really defined my career going forward. Um, I always talk about um, being inspired by nature and human nature and the lives of women. Um, so you'll see various series of my work over the years that uh, either uh, 
are focused on one or both or a combination of those themes. Uh, and so I went on to uh, have a career as an art professor. I taught at Lawrence University for, for 10 years before coming back to Madison and becoming what's called the director of the Women in Gender Studies Consortium, uh, which I uh, ran that for 20 years and then retired two years ago to finally being a full-time artist with no other obligations. Um, and so I've been happily ensconced in my studio in Madison ever since. I, I created art throughout those years, um, but, um, but it's only been in recent years that I've been able to just do my art. And I also teach privately. I, I teach a lot of watercolor workshops and workshops around finding your voice in the arts creativity workshops um, going forward. I work entirely in watercolor. I, uh, when I was younger, I thought I would never work in watercolor. I, I worked in it before going to college, and then I, I, I was taught that oils and acrylics were more important, and so I tried to avoid watercolor, um, and because again, it's kind of a gendered uh, material. Women have access to watercolor because they can use it in their kitchens and their children can drink the water and not be poisoned. They don't need a big studio. So it's more common for women to have access to watercolor historically. Anyway, um, I accidentally uh, had a semester while I was in college where I could not take any painting classes except watercolor if I wanted to. T I was just jammed up schedule. So I took it begrudgingly and I fell in love. And <laughs> I, I just, I just love watercolor. I've loved it since the, I guess I loved it as a kid too, but, but uh, from that time on to now, it's like now I've been doing watercolor for 35 years. Um, I worked in oils and acrylics for many years prior to that, but um, I find it endlessly exciting and fun and I learn new things and it's still a challenge. And as long as it is, I'll keep doing it. Now I do watercolor both on watercolor on paper, which is what you're used to seeing, but also I work watercolor on canvas. And there's a few pieces in the show that are watercolor on canvas, which is a slightly different technical approach, but every bit as much fun. So um, I think that's enough to get us started. Yes. Helen? Yes. Um, when I heard that we were paired for this uh, ex exhibition, I, I decided to try to think of what I what I would do. And <laughs> I, so I said, Helen Klebisato, close my eyes, and very strong feminine image, imagery came forward. And there are pieces in the show which are very definitely feminine, and you inspire. Yeah. There, you are just um, vibrating with feminine energy because you have been immersed in it for so long, I would imagine, or you came into the world vibrating with it. I don't know. Can I ask you a question? Do you think that the urge to create something is feminine in origin? And I don't mean that as, I mean, of course, men have feminine energy and they also have masculine, we all have a combination. But I was thinking that, that it's, it's a feminine, quality in a way. Do you think so or am I getting I think it's a human, I honestly think it's a human quality and what's interesting about that is for years and years and years the historical understanding of creativity was that men create and women procreate. So that's part of the legacy that we're fighting. But I I do believe that women um, are incredible creators, but I think men are incredible too. creators too. I it, think it's, that, it's I the think, same energy. And it can be housed in a different form. I think it's thinking. I think art is thinking. And it's just thinking visually or in any other medium. And I, I believe we all have access to it. It's just some of us have either been encouraged to do it or have just have reacted to discouragement with the attitude of, oh, yeah watch. And uh, one of the reasons I think that uh, I appreciate what you say about the feminine energy, Georgia, I think part of what's radiating there is that early on, after my disappointing start in the arts, where I felt like I was taught that I was lacking, 
um, that I, uh, and pro probably women and gender studies helped me with this too. Um, I decided to really complete, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I can decided to completely, yeah, good. I decided to completely embrace being female and to pay close attention to whenever I felt something gendered that was um, discouraging me from, from being as fully human as I could be in my woman's body. And, um, and I think anyone who is searching for the great quality in themselves is drawn to your work. And that's one of the yeah, things that I makes the work. I'm exploring my own femininity. Yeah, it's, it's part of the subtext of the work. Absolutely. Okay. We'll have to talk later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but also that's, you know, I see that in your work too, which is I'm a collector of your work. I love your work. And so that, um, I'm not surprised that we share that. Yeah. So. Except I don't think it's thinking. To me, I don't think when I create things, I is totally intuitive. Right. It's the kind of thinking that's not often valued. It's so deep that you're not interrupted by um, presumption. That's a whole nother conversation we could have for a really long time. <laughs> Talk to you later. Yeah. Thank you both for that. Thank you both for taking the time to tell us about that. And um, I'm wondering actually if you guys, if you women, sorry, I shouldn't say guys, if you could both <laughs> tell us a little bit about this is right behind me, conveniently enough, hanging here at the gallery. If anyone's nearby and wants to come in and see it, I highly encourage you to do so. This is Egyptian Dream, and I wonder if you could both tell us a little bit about this collaboration that you've worked on. Sure. I'm, going to, I'm going to ask Georgia to start, but I just want to mention one thing. Do you see the piece behind me with the lilies, with the colors? Those yes. are the colors that that piece really has in it. It's just a little washed out because of the, the light that's on it. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> but you're yeah, just I, yeah. I have always, and I found out later that Helen too has always been interested in ancient Egyptian artifacts. And um, I decided I, I wanted to make a, a pectoral. I was very, uh, taken by these large necklaces that sit on your chest. So I designed and made a pectoral, which has all of the symbols that you might find in uh, Egyptian jewelry. It has snakes, it has falcons, it has a crescent moon, and it has a turquoise, which is popular. And um, it has, let's see, uh, glass beads, which which are indicative of water. So um, I made this uh, piece and it just somehow was crying out for a house <laughs> to where it could reside. And we had this idea that uh, Helen could, well, I should tell you that part, but what you can do by combining her painting and my, my uh, pectoral is you can adorn your body when you take it off the painting and wear it, or and you can also adorn your, your wall by mm -hmm. hanging it back on the painting. So Helen, do you want to talk about how it inspired you? Sure, I'll take it away from, one of the things as an educator and an artist that I've always been interested in is what gets to be called art and what gets to be called fine art and what art we display on the wall. You know, for me, it started out looking at quilts and saying, why is that art not the same kind of art? Why aren't all the quilters I know considering themselves to be artists? And why does the wall art, you know, does it become, does a quilt become art when it goes on the wall versus on a bed when in fact every stitch is made to keep you warm? <laughs> you know? So, um, so that when Georgia, actually Georgia proposed the idea and I was very enthusiastic in my response to it, both because I loved that piece but also um, because of this idea, the idea of creating a um, environment where this piece, which is so lovely, could be displayed all the time in a, and then uh, experimenting with that collaboration. So my painting was done very much in response to the, her or artwork that already existed in the world. And uh, so I spent a lot of time with it. I got to have possession of it for quite a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> as I create, and then I created what I thought would be a, a lovely environment for it, inspired by the subject matter of her piece. So it was, it's an experiment, and I, we had fun. I'm happy with it. And yeah, yeah there's two little pegs there that it just sets on. Yeah, and, uh, and then uh, so I, I decided that I would imagine that as when the when the uh, uh, pectoral is not in situ, it, I, I decided it just looked like uh, reflections of the moon on the water. <laughs> uh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so that so was fun. Good. It was fun to have this added element. Yeah. Uh, as, as we uh, thought about how to, you know, we we were originally going to have this as a face-to-face -face exhibition in the gallery, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm delighted that uh, um, Christina and River Arts on the Water were willing to do that pivot, so that we could uh, try and bring it to the world virtually. Um, so, so thank you for that. Yes. All right, so I do, if you, I'm going to kick off the question and answer with a question from myself, but for anyone out there watching, if you have a question for Helen or Georgia or both, please go ahead and type it in the chat box and we will get to as many of them as time allows. Um, and I'll read off the questions for you, Helen and Georgia, so you don't have to worry about following the chat. I'll take care of that part. But my question for you both is, you titled this exhibition Force of Nature, and I'm wondering if you could tell me where that name came from and why it was so powerful and resonated with each of you. Go first, Georgia. <laughs> well, we were, we were brainstorming. We just yeah. threw out a bunch of names, and um, actually you suggested it. It was part of a list of possible yeah. topics that you threw out, and it just leaped yeah. at me. It leaped out at me. It just felt great. We did, a, we did, we did a straight out brainstorming session over several days, over a week, I'd say, where we both kind of proposed and then, and then we're like, mm, not quite, but uh, this makes me think of that. So I may have come up with the final title, but it was absolutely from the, the collaborative process. Yeah. That, that's what's been so nice about this. It's not just two artists who um, are just showing together. We, we've had some real interactions around what works we were going to show and um, and the collaborative piece and the title. It's been it's been a lot of fun. It is. Thank you. And it's interesting when we do this, you know, the guest feature and the reception, not all artists choose to title their exhibitions. Sometimes they just go with it as like a plain and simple list of the artist names. But I think this one felt obviously for a lot of reasons, pretty different from uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the shows we've had in the past. And I think it's a really powerful name. I'm really glad you both chose it. Um, yeah. Well, we it's, know each other's it's work. Like a complete work of art the, the, to me. Mm -hmm. It's the title and the pieces and the energy. It's just a whole package. I I'm think I'm very pleased to be part of it. I think of exhibitions like writing a book where each piece is a chapter, but together um, they, they say something else at the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that would happen with my work and George's together. I feel like it has, and, and uh, I think the title is a guide. Somebody has a question for you, I think. Yes, yeah, so the question from CJ Laurie, I would like to ask <laughs> Helen about her pieces that seem to be looking up through the treetops. I find these very intimate for some reason and would like to know what attracts her about this view. I just want to mention that C.J. Laurie is an incredible surrealist landscape artist who combines magic with her paints and her trees. And yeah, um, my, that view is straight out from being a kid lying on the ground looking straight up at the clouds or uh, uh, I walk through the woods uh, and I, uh, many of the trees I do are um, from through cedar trees because I spend a lot of time in Door County and I do walk or stop and look if I trip too much uh, up and just to see the place where the the trees come together because sometimes they form shapes sometimes they just avoid each other but some and create nice patterns where the the branches come together but sometimes they create shapes and so um I just find it very uplifting. Um, I, you know, your feet are on the ground, but you rise up with the 
So I hope that's an answer, but my own little twist. Thank you. I, I think that's all I got. <laughs> that was, thank you. Thank you, CJ, for your question. If anyone else has a question, feel free to type it. I have another one for you guys, for both of you. Um, how did each of you discover your, well, I guess you both kind of answered this, Helen, you with watercolor and Georgia with silver, but um, if there was a type of media that you would like to try other than your own, what are you, you most curious, what would you love to give a try? I would like to paint like Helen. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it a try. It didn't, it didn't stick, but um, I, I've done some stained glass and I love the colors. So I, I, would, I think I would do more of that at some point. I am, when I taught, I taught print, I taught uh, etching and uh, uh, relief printing and lithography. I taught all those media. And I have not, I don't have a print studio anymore since I resigned from uh, teaching there. And so I, it's not a medium I haven't done, um, but I, I miss the printing presses, which make it so much easier to, and in fact, I just bought a, a small printing press so that I can, yes, can play with that. And I find, um, for me, if I switch media for a while, like I'll, I will, I do work in other media. I'm just known for my watercolor. Uh, and I, and the other media doesn't always find the light of day, but I've worked in, in uh, fibers and, and printmaking and uh, I'll, I'll give anything a try if I have access to the materials. Um, and I, but what I like about it is when I work in another medium, it gives me new ideas for subject matter. It just shifts what I'm thinking about. And so I can sometimes bring that subject matter into my watercolors and reinterpret it through that. So if I'm ever in a time where I'm feeling um, like I'm just treading water and not really pushing the edges in my subject matter, I will go directly to a new media and try it out. And then the other thing I really, I would love to weave baskets, even though my sister makes fun of me in, in, about underwater basket weaving. Or, but I, um, I actually have taken to finding old broken baskets and weaving back in um, from old water, I cut up old watercolor paintings and turn them into strips. Because they're uh -huh. and I, I fix the basket, so it's part of the um, mend it movement. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's a great use reuse of materials, right? And it's a lot easier than doing the basket from scratch. I'll just say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we have a next question. Did either of you have pieces that started one way but took a very different turn during the process or is it something that you plan very carefully from start to finish and have it all planned out? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> when things don't go right, they become part of the design. <laughs> That's how I work. <laughs> and uh, I realized, you know, not everybody knows it was an accident because they didn't know what the original intention was. I mean, I don't try to pawn off anything that looks shabby, but <laughs> often the original design, uh, what what the original, what the piece ends up looking like is not what I intended does happen frequently. Okay. Yeah, for, I, for, I use a variety of different. Reveal something. There's a piece in the show called Reflections in Water, which has lots of little gold beads around the, the bezel. I wasn't crazy about the way the bezel came out, so I added those gold beads, and everybody thinks that's a fabulous feature, I'm happy to say, but it was not originally intended. Yeah, and I think that's that's a good example. I, I often incorporate chants. I didn't used to, but over the years as I've been teaching uh, watercolor to other folks, I um, have more and more incorporated chants in the beginnings of my paintings, where I'll start with textures and then I have to grapple with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I also sometimes start where I just start from a drawing and, and paint it, but I find it a lot more fun to, to bring um, chance into the process. And part of it is that I, um, one of the reasons I'm never bored is that I never give myself a chance to be uh, bored because I look at, um, for lack of a better word, mistakes in a painting 
as an opportunity to learn something new. It really is an opportunity. My students are driven crazy. <gasps> you have a new opportunity here. <laughs> I call them the what <laughs> the what the hell paintings where, where you get to yeah, you get to a point where it's just like, oh I hate this. Ah, oh, what the hell? Let's try something new. And you know, so let's throw some, you know, and, and so actually that's incredibly exciting. And so what I've tried to do is take what I learned from doing those kinds of things into the beginning of new works. So I'm starting right out with, oh, well, let's see what happens if. I wonder what will happen is. Because otherwise, we don't really learn anything new. Um, or we don't even try and learn anything new till what we already know how to do fails us. So it's at points of failure that we're more likely to learn and try something new. So, so yes. My, <laughs> my German goldsmith Meister used to say, perfect is tot. Perfect is dead. Oh. You know, if, <laughs> I mean, what right. we have to offer is sometimes is the imperfection of a handmade work of art. It does not look like a machine made piece. Right. Right. Because if, if it's too perfect, you've probably started to rely on a formula and just mm -hmm. repeat and repeat and repeat. And for some people, that's fine, but uh, that would drive me crazy. Um, yeah. I, I would get bored. Okay, thank you so much to both of you. I'm gonna like move us along because we have a couple of questions here. So CJ Laurie also submitted this one. I would like to know how climate change has affected the way that you depict nature. And Helen, I know you have a specific collection dedicated to this. Do you want to take it away on this one? Well, I'll just say look up theflowersareburning.com. <laughs> but uh, um, I, still, I still rely on beauty. But I, uh, to bring people to look at my art, because I, uh, it's one of the issues with climate change this is such a big issue and so hard to look at that people will find any excuse to look away. Uh, and so what I, what I actually try to do is use the um, beauty to bring people in and make it possible for them to access the, the issues um, through the lens of the beauty. Now, for instance, uh, I, there's one painting in the show that's called Prairie Fire. And it's fire, and we know what fire does, especially now with California, Oregon, Colorado burning now. Mine are, <clears throat> oh my, excuse me, get rid of this. My, um, ah, my, <laughs> sorry, my, um, mine are prairie fires, which are good fires. They, they um, clean up all the dead grasses and crack the seeds so that things can grow again. Um, so uh, so anyway, the theme of climate change is important in my work, but it's still important to me to use uh, the, uh, I tend to be somebody who uses beauty to try and access those themes, even as I um, focus in on that as a subject matter. And I, I, think, I could go on for hours on that, so I'll just. Yeah, that's, that's your topic. <laughs> but beauty is something I'd like to just make a comment about. Beauty is what I, think we have to offer to the world as artists. And it's not trivial, as you can hear, for instance, Helen's approach allows people to look at things that are ugly through beauty. And what, I, what has occurred to me is that sometimes we look at a work of art and we feel hopeful. And sometimes we might look at a work of art and it brings us great joy. But what I wanna say is that it has occurred to me that it's not that the work of art puts something into us that isn't already there. That's the beauty of it. These are all qualities that we have deep inside of us that get triggered by the work of art that we're looking at. It's like we have this pool of natural resources that are core. Helen, you're going to get <laughs> We have this pool of natural resources at our core that get stirred up and these things rise to the surface and we realize that they're all that that's who we are. So there's so many dimensions to the beauty of art, and we have so much to offer in so many different ways. I think that's a great answer. Thank you both so much for that. We have another question from Catherine R. Do you have any self-imposed limitations or rules about how you approach your work? I believe that it helps to have limitations. 
because um, so many I'll people have I didn't understand it. I it it helps to give yourself limitations oh because um if you can do anything it can be overwhelming and so i often will set myself some parameters which i think of as limitations uh, and work in series so i artificially create limits that i can push against at, in order to uh, try to go deeper into a subject matter however if those limits get in the way then i'll just break them but <laughs> but uh, but that but i'm really kind to myself because i it's hard to be always on the money always being creative and so what i do is i you know i let myself start very small and uh i don't expect every piece to be a masterwork in fact i i believe in the process over the product and that the product just documents the process but i have found that actually limitations in the form of creating a subject matter you're going to focus on is very very useful how about you georgia uh, i was just distracted by somebody's comment about do you tell people to walk away from it when when they're stuck yeah my, my, yep. all my students can in, together go back away from the painting <laughs> oh, back away i thought she said whack, walk away because that's no. one of the things that i try to get myself to do i try really hard to listen to mm, sort of my my inner artist if you can call it that and realize i shouldn't be continuing on the, with this right now i should just walk away <laughs> and come back to it and not say, oh, if I just spend a little more time, I can get it. That's usually a mistake. So yeah. I guess the rule I have to myself for myself is to not force something and to be kind to myself and not think I'm a loser or yeah. there's something wrong with me for not being able to get this right now. It really helps if you have a dog. CJ will appreciate that. Um, it's really, it really helps if you have a dog that forces you to walk away from the painting to walk them. Because it never fails that if I do step away from something, I might be deep buried in it, wanting to keep going, going, going. And the dog makes me walk him. And, I, and on the walk, I have all these great ideas about what I could do to make it even better. Yeah. And, and I come back and I see it with fresh eyes. So uh, I, yeah, that's a backing away, stepping away is a, a great artist tool. Yeah. Thank you both. And that, Georgia, I like your point, and Helen, you brought this up about being kind to yourself. I think that's something, especially maybe beginning artists struggle with where they're just trying something new for the first time and it doesn't come out perfect on the first try. So they're like, oh, I'm done. I'm gonna give up. I'll never work on this again. I'm not a good artist, right? And yet, it's hard as an adult to be a beginner at something. Exactly. You know, we're not used to being beginners. Yeah. But and a lot of times art is something that's portrayed as an innate skill. You have it or you don't. And you have all of it at once or none of it. And that's quite a myth that I think a lot of us are trying to get out there and just let yourself be curious. Let yourself try things and let it not work. You know, I think that's an important thing that we can communicate to anybody out there. Absolutely. It's really disrespectful to artists who have made their career as artists to to believe that it uh, that it doesn't require study and hard work. That doesn't mean somebody can't make an authentically artistic and wonderful piece at any stage from day one. But to uh, just say it's just it's just something you're born with negates all the many years of work that people have done honing their honing their skill and their story and their work and their yeah so it's a double-edged sword definitely all right well i have one other question for you and then if anything else comes up in the chat otherwise this might be a good one to end on and i wonder if each of you could tell me what you think is the best part about being an artist and what is the hardest slash worst part about being an artist it's a curveball. I didn't warn them that I was going to answer this question. So this is fully putting you on the spot, and I apologize for that. No, no. <laughs> no. Take it, Helen. You want me to go first? The best. <laughs> it's an incredible. It's an incredible privilege to be an artist. I mean, I, um, I have. I, I don't know what happened in my life that gave me the um, 
the power to resist all the voices in our culture that tell us that it's not okay to be an artist, that being an artist is a waste of time. It's out there. That's why I tell everybody who does any art at all, who shows up to do their creative work, that I consider them warriors, you know, because you can't make art without thinking for yourself. You have to make decisions. You cannot be a lemming. And so I always have said, told people that I think teaching art is like, has an effect at the voting booth, which let me just say vote. But anyway, but because you, because you can think for yourself, you can make decisions, you can um, learn to um, trust your own instincts because you test them. Um, I think that's, that's a lot of it. I feel like I have been able to try and be a whole human being because I have given myself permission to be an artist. And that brings together my, my body, my, my spirituality, my intellect, all of those parts of me that um, all humans should have access to. I, I have had the great privilege, uh, though I had to fight for it, but I still have been able to do it. So I'm proud of myself. And I, I don't think everybody gets to say that. Uh, and I, I'm going to pass it now. Or I'm going to cry. So <laughs> that's the best part. Was there another part? Of, was it worst part or best part? Um, uh, the, part. Both, but I think that's a fantastic yeah. answer. Yeah, yeah. The challenge. It's a challenge, and t it's worth it. There you go. All right. I'll I'll just say um, this is not my first career. I've had about seven careers. <laughs> <laughs> And, and in each of those, and all the different things that I did, I, I was doing somebody else's work. So to have an opportunity to, to do my own work is just a real joy. And I think that everybody has a unique quality of spirit and different ways of expressing it. And whatever you do, you can find a way to do that. But when you have nobody telling you and uh, have the opportunity to allow yourself to be led from within, mm. it, there's nothing better. It's a, it is a privilege. Of course, I had to work lots of years and sock money away <laughs> in order to <laughs> be able to live. It's not the easiest way to earn a living, but yeah. um, it is a real, a real joy. And I think also when you when you do that and you show people what you've done, it gives them permission to do the same thing. It gives them permission to express themselves and to explore their own unique quality of spirit. So I like being able to do that. You guys, those were such good answers. You're going <laughs> to meet here up over here. My goodness. I was expecting like a goofy. Oh, that was so great. Okay. Let's keep talking. Oh, I guess. We can. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we are running short on time. So at this point, I really want to send out a really heartfelt thank you to Georgia and Helen for sharing your work with us and sharing your thoughts and feelings and really hard, hard fought efforts with us. It's a joy to have your artwork presented through our gallery. And I thank everyone in the audience for coming tonight. I appreciate wow. spending a Tuesday <laughs> evening with us. Big wave, a big round of applause for everybody. I so, so appreciate it. This recording um, will be available as part on the website later if you wanna come back and visit it again. Um, the show will be up at riverartsinc.org slash F-O-N through the end of the year. I encourage you to look at the artwork, read the statements, and just really find the joy in this show that we've had presenting it. So thank you all so much once again. Have a wonderful thank evening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for doing such a good job moderating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. It's so